All right, Tim, go ahead. Good evening. Welcome to Chapter Connect. I'm your host, Dr. Tim Radke, Vice President for Chapters at the Explorers Club. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing you to the St. Louis chapter of our club. The St. Louis chapter is led by their chapter chair, Cynthia Peters. Cynthia is an entrepreneur. She's had an extensive career in finance. She has served on numerous boards. She's gone on a medical expedition to Mount Everest, and she participates in conservation efforts in the US, Africa, and Myanmar. Cynthia, welcome to Chapter Connect. Thank you. The pleasure to be here. Um, I, I'm Cindy Peters, uh, the St. Louis Chapter Chair, and I wanna thank both the Explorers Club and especially Ann Passer and Kevin Murphy and Tim Radke for allowing us to showcase some of our members who you will be hearing from shortly. Um, first, however, it's an honor and a pleasure to tell you about our chapter and our current officers. Our chapter was formed in 1988 in response to a request from National to Audrey Spafford Young to form a chapter here in St. Louis. Um, Audrey actually, which is I think interesting, was among the early group of women to be admitted to the Explorers Club in, in the uh, mid to late-ish 1980s. So Audrey got the prerequisite number of members, and I think it was 28, um, to organize um, and form a chapter here. And that chapter was initially called the Explorers Club St. Louis Mississippi Valley Chapter. But since that time, we've changed the name to the Explorers Club St. Louis Chapter. And we have approximately 67 members and we're growing. Um, our region is fairly large. It includes Missouri and Iowa, Arkansas, Kansas. And we also have members in 13 other states and countries. We're pleased to have a number of our chapter members who serve both on the national board and many of its committees. Normally we, hope our, we host our dinner meetings from September to May, and then we have summer adventures. But this year we've been curtailed to Zoom tales and Zoom lectures as I, I think all the rest of you have too. Um, generally our meetings are held in um, several, Kevin, um, rotating places. Um, and uh, we've had chapter adventures during the summer. Um, and um, we don't have an official meeting place, but this was when um, Solar Impulse was here in St. Louis. Um, but we met at such places as the St. Louis Zoo, the Endangered Wolf Sanctuary, and other spots where our chapter adventure takes us. Um, Next, next, yeah, thank you. Our chapter has its own pin that was specially commissioned um, by Dr. Mabel Perkerson in 2008 and is given to each new member who joins our chapter. Several years ago, our members of our chapter proposed and sponsored Amelia Earhart and William Clark as members of the Legacy Society. We were the first chapter to host the Lowell Thomas Dinner outside of New York and by all standards, it was a huge success. I've been a member national since 2007, and I'm the ninth chairperson of the Explorers Club St. Louis. I became the chapter chair this past June. Our other officers are Vice Chair Marguerite Garrick, Secretary Dr. Bruce Chalker, Assistant Secretary Thomas Schlafly Esquire, Treasurer John Hume, and Membership Chair Dr. Mabel Perkerson. Lately, we've made a concerted effort, which is ongoing to revamp our website. And I hope at some point you'll have time to look at it where you can read the bios of our officers and other members and those of our past chairs. Um, I think you'll really enjoy it. Um, we've got some great members and um, well, I know all the chapters do. So that's um, a little bit about our chapter. Um, and I guess it's time now for me to go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Um, and I'm gonna tell you right now that I'm gonna read the uh, bios because they're all so terrific that I don't wanna, don't wanna mess anything up or, or misspeak. So bear with me, please. Uh, Dr. Peter Weiss Jackson is president of the Missouri Botanical Garden and George Engelman professor of botany at Washington University in St. Louis. He joined the, jar the garden in 2010 
coming from Dublin, Ireland, where he's been director of the National Botanic Gardens of Ireland since 2005. He was a driving force behind the development of a global strategy for plant conservation that was adopted by 190 plus countries in 2002 through the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity. He has chaired the global partnership for plant conservation since then to support the achievement of the strategy worldwide. Peter has been a scientific development and management advisor to a large number of botanic gardens and arboreta in over 40 countries and has lectured in 70 countries. He's authored over 300 scientific papers and is an author, co-author or editor of 14 books. In 2012, he conceived a plan to prepare Flora of the World by 2020, which is today online with information on every known plant species, including 1.3 million names and over 400,000 plant descriptions. The World Flora Online is managed by a consortium of 44 bot botanical institutions worldwide, which he co-chairs. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to Peter. Thank you very much, Cindy. Now I'm going to try and share my screen and make sure you can all see. Uh, hold on now. Okay, I hope that's working for everyone. Thank you very much. It's a really great pleasure for me to uh, be with you all this evening and to tell you about some of the work that I undertake in plant conservation that has brought me to many diverse parts of the world over the years. In 1985, I led an expedition to the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean to help save endangered plant species there. And that's going to be a bit of my focus and what I talk about now. I was curator of a small university Botanic Garden in Ireland at the time, and my visit to Mauritius was really my first international experience. Most people know of Mauritius as the only home of the late lamented dodo that became extinct in the 1600s. Mauritius has a rich flora that was and is still critically threatened. Over the years of colonial and agricultural expansion and settlement and the spread of invasive species, its natural habitats are reduced to uh, just about 2% of what they used to be. And probably the most endangered is a palm, Hyophorbi americolis, that has one surviving specimen. I was up a ladder in 1985 trying to pollinate the flowers, and to date no one has succeeded in propagating it, although many of us have tried. Its close relative, uh, Hyophorbi lagenicolis, the round island bottle palm, uh, had only three mature specimens on its island home. It was saved uh, by being in cultivation throughout the world. Whenever I see it, I give this old friend a really big hug. But one of the species that I became intrigued with was Nisocodon mauritianus, the Mauritius bellflower. It is so distinct that it was placed in its own genus with only one species. It's mainly confined to a 500 foot high waterfall and risking life and limb, I managed to collect a couple of seed capsules from the cliff in 1985. And today, every specimen in cultivation is derived from those few seeds I gathered. It has beautiful blue flowers, rich in red ne nectar, and they're pollinated by geckos, one of the few uh, lizards pollinated plants. But my experience in Mauritius made me realize that botanic gardens could play a huge role in conserving tens of thousands of threatened plant species worldwide. 
Shortly after I returned from Mauritius, I joined Botanic Gardens Conservation International and spent the next 18 years traveling around the world, helping to grow botanic gardens and their plant conservation roles. And then a decade ago, I came to the Missouri Botanical Garden, uh, attracted by its global reputation as a center for conservation and botanical research. It was therefore a huge pleasure for me to be able to return to Mauritius with the garden and bring new methodologies and priorities to plant conservation work needed there. Mauritius still has uh, remarkable species that are in desperate need of conservation. One is Cylindricline commissonii. It's reduced to only 10 plants in the wild on the top of the Pous Mountain. The Pous, uh, a, a, a thumb-shaped uh, mountain, was actually climbed by Charles Darwin when he visited Mauritius on the Beagle. There are now 50 specimens of uh, the Cylindricline in the greenhouses of the Missouri Botanical Garden. It, but of course, it's it's really one thing to propagate a, a rare plant, but you often have to find it first. And we have started using drone technology to reach some of the most inaccessible places on the island and see if any of the rarest plants survive there as yet undiscovered. On the Mauritius uh, Nizakodan waterfall, the gardens team brought a drone to map the plants that survive there. The red circles are uh, confirmed specimens, the yellow ones are possibly more, and there are only about 35 uh, plants left in the wild, in the world. With the drone, let's see if we can play this little video, okay. With the drone, we can reach uh, places that would otherwise be completely inaccessible. If we're to re rescue individual species, we need to ensure that we can capture the full range of their genetic diversity too. And, but when you think sampling the diversity for Nizakodon promises to be a continuing challenge. At the, at, the, at the garden, the conservation of plants has become a, a really top priority for the institution. And we now have over 1,500 threatened plant species in the living collections. But conserving the species is not enough. We need to ensure that they have wild habitats in which to thrive. One of our largest programs is in Madagascar. It has a native flora of some 14,000 plant species and rapidly disappearing forests. There we have 13 special community reserves under our care, containing thousands of unique plant species. And one of the tiniest is the reserve of Ancafo Bay, a remnant of highland forest surrounding, surrounded by land cleared for slash and burn agriculture. And Cafe Bay provides employment for local people, and that's so important. They grow plants for reforestation, they're guiding tourists, they're safeguarding the forests from the regular fires. You can see the fire break in this slide. They are protecting the reserves, plants and animals, which is their priority. And it includes one special plant at least, which is Shizolina tampoclatsana, which is now more or less confined to Ancafo Bay. One of the most recently discovered uh, new plant species from Madagascar, discovered by garden scientists, is Melanophila dianiae, a critically endangered species, it's only known from five surviving trees. And these are at risk of being cut down for firewood almost any day. Propagation from seed and cuttings has been tried without success. But our Madagascar team has climbed the last remaining tall trees and managed to root some uh, cuttings grown from air layers. We now have these four young plants in cultivation, the beginnings of what will be many years of effort to safeguard this species. The species is named in honor of my wife, Diane, and I will be in big trouble indeed if this species were to ever go extinct. 
Thank you very much. Cindy, back to you. Thank you. That was terrific. And you know, you still, uh, we've been thwarted a couple of times. You still owe me a trip. To <laughs> Indeed. Um, now it's um, my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Bruce Chalker. Um, before his retirement, Bruce was a biological oceanographer. He conducted research on coral reefs and um, algal photo adaptation. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that right, Bruce. Um, in Florida, the Bahamas, the Caribbean, and Anahuitoc Atoll in the Marshall Islands, on the Australian Great Barrier Reef, and in Ar Antarctica. He's logged more than 1,200 research dives and routinely dives down to a depth of 250 feet and saturated twice in the hydro lab underwater habitat. Subsequent to that, he was a patent attorney and currently among his other pursuits, he is a horticultural volunteer at the Missouri Botanical Garden. So Bruce, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Cindy. And good evening, it's a pleasure to be with you all. Would you like to put up the uh, title slide, please? Thank you. For as long as humans have lived in tropical ocean areas, they've been associated with coral reefs. But a scientific study of those reefs is a relatively modern endeavor dating to the early 20th century. Next slide, please. The pioneering coral reef scientists clearly understood that corals were colonial animals consisting of small polyps with a mouth and feeding tentacles, a common gut, and chock full of unicellular brown alga, shown on the right on this slide. During the day, these algae photosynthesize like any other plant, and a certain percentage of the sugars that they produce leak out to the corals as a supplementary food supply. In addition, this high rate of photosynthesis causes the corals to increase the rate at which they can deposit their calcium carbonate skeleton. Unfortunately, although these corals live in very shallow tropical waters, they're also simultaneously very vulnerable to increases in temperature. So that if on the tops of the reefs during midsummer, if the seas are calm, Corals can become heat stressed and the response to that is to throw out the internal algae and this is the phenomenon that's known as coral bleaching. Fortunately, some of the algae will always survive on the underside of the coral skeletons and if the coral itself survives the experience, these algae can recolonize their hosts. During the 1960s, 70s and 80s, it became possible to measure these growth of these corals in a variety of ways. For fast growing corals, it was possible on a scale of months to years to actually physically measure the growth of the corals. On a scale of hours and days, growth can be measured by calcium 45 incorporation, the radioactive isotope. And for a few species that have massive corals, their growth rates are recorded in annual growth bands within the skeleton. By the 1990s, it became possible to measure coral growth with underwater instrumentation. Next slide, please. This technique was pioneered by a gentleman named David Barnes at the Australian Institute of Marine Science and drifted his instrumentation across the shallow reef flats. I've adapted that technique to be deployed underwater and we deployed this instrumentation across the width of the Great Barrier Reef from the surface down to as deep as corals grow and on extreme edge of the coral reef, on the edge of the uh, coral sea, we're deploying instrumentation down to 250 feet. There are two particular results that have come out of this, this study I'm going to describe today. The first was the realization that corals grow much faster at depths between 30 and 60 feet for a particular species, then they do at shallower and deeper depths. The reason is 
that the algae inside the corals are photoadapting. They're making more chlorophyll, more accessory pigments. They're better able to use the light to grow and to deposit skeletons. Below a depth of about 60 feet, there's still photoadaptation, there's still photosynthesis, but the growth of these corals becomes increasingly slower. Corals can be found on these clear ocean reefs down to a depth of at least 350 feet and probably a little bit more in very limited numbers. The re other remaining question that was niggling in the back of everybody's mind is how in the world can you have a really clear animal living in a high light environment pelted by environmental light and they're not absolutely fried? Next slide. And the answer is these corals are able to incorporate significant con concentrations of UV absorbing compounds. They're known as microsporin like amino acids. And collectively, they form a band block filter that intercepts the ultraviolet light in the UVB region, which is just below the visible, dissipates that energy harmlessly and thereby saves the coral host. Next slide, please. And that's the end of my slides. Over the past hundred years, people have been concerned about what activities humans are doing in the adjacent to coral reefs that might be detrimental to the well being of those corals. Recently, of course, it's the fact that global climate change and environmental warning is an increasing problem. What I hope by the presentation today is that we will share a bit of an understanding about how these corals that are superbly adapted to these pristine environments and very efficient are simultaneously very vulnerable to the possibility of rapid global climate change. And I'm sure we're gonna hear more on those topics by other members of the Explorers Club at future events. Thank you very much. Back to you, Cindy. Thank you, Bruce. That was terrific. Um, it was really, really fascinating. Um, now I want to introduce you to Dr. Jeffrey Bonner. Um, he's a fellow national um, of O3. And in April 2002, Dr. Bonner was appointed president and CEO of the St. Louis Zoo. In 2009, his position was endowed by the Dana Brown Charitable Trust. He has chaired the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, AZA, the um, Amphibian Arc, the International Species Information System, and the Madagascar Fauna and Flora Group. He served on the board of the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums, WATSA, and currently serves on boards, including the Conservation Breeding Specialist Group, Bio St. Louis, Higher Education Channel TV, Forest Park Forever, and St. Louis Regional Chamber of Growth Association, the RCGA. He's a member of the Explorers Club, the Academy of Science, and the AZA. Dr. Bonner received his doctorate from Columbia University in New York. He is a Burgess Fellow, Traveling Fellow, Fulbright Scholar, President's Fellow, and a recipient of the National Research Service Award. Dr. Bonner is also the author of numerous articles and books, including Sailing with Noah's Stories from the World of Zoos. So, Jeff, Thank all you. yours. Thank you. I have to be completely honest with you. I really regret being here tonight. I'm supposed to be in Botswana, in the Okavango Delta, in the field camp with the painted dogs, tracking dogs. And instead, I'm sitting here in my office in St. Louis talking about painted dogs, but I guess that's the next best thing. I love Botswana. It's, it's a, a fascinating country. It's about the size of France, um, but very sparsely populated. It's, its population is about the size of St. Louis, around 2.3 million people. It has a, a very high standard of income. Uh, after they got their independence from Britain in 1966, they discovered diamonds. So along with ecotourism and, and cattle ranching, uh, they, they've, they've, uh, they have a very, very high standard of living. Uh, Part of the reason why Botswana is so sparsely populated is that 70% of Botswana is occupied by the Kalahari Desert. So there's very few people living there. In fact, it really only concentrated in a, I don't know, a handful of, of relatively small towns. Uh, 
but not all of Botswana is arid. In fact, uh, the Okavango Delta is, is one of the most lush oases on the planet. The Okavango Delta is the world's largest inland delta. It's formed when the Okavango River, which is sometimes called the river that never finds the sea, flows into the Kalahari and it dies there. But in the process, it creates this enormous oasis of, of, of uh, plant life and animal life, just uh, really unparalleled anywhere uh, that I've seen in the world. Uh, I've had the extraordinary privilege of going on safari maybe 20 times in Africa. I worked a little bit in the bush in, in Kenya. Uh, I've never found any place that is as rich and diverse um, in terms of seeing wildlife as this place is. Uh, it has Africa's top predators, but what it has in abundance in comparison to other parts of Africa is uh, painted dogs. Uh, painted dogs are really remarkable species. They uh, they're like lungs on legs. They're about 50 pounds. You can see a picture there. Uh, really three colors, enormous ears, probably for cooling. Um, they're, they're unique among, amongst carnivores because they have a, a very different sort of social structure. They take care of their sick and their aged and their wounded and their young. Um, and uh, to a degree that frankly people don't do, if, if you want my honest opinion. Uh, they uh, uh, live in packs of say maybe oh, 10 to 12 on average, up to 40. Uh, the uh, uh, alpha male and the alpha female breed, they, they give birth to anywhere between two and 20 uh, cubs. And then the entire group raises those cubs. And you might find, oh, I don't know, call him your weird uncle Harry, who they leave behind as, as the sort of the babysitter. And he's, he's too old to really do a good job hunting and probably would get in the way anyway. But um, when they come back from the hunt, they not only feed the, the, uh, the, the pups, but they also feed Uncle Harry. They really take care of, of their own. Uh, remarkable group, uh, really, in, in many respects. Um, unfortunately, like all predators in Africa, their, their biggest threat is, is people. Uh, painted dogs in particular are so smart about getting through fences. I've seen them jump right through electric fences with, with barely a yelp. Uh, you'd have to have fences with dig barriers enormously high. You couldn't even have right angle fences with, with painted dogs because they'd walk right up them. You can imagine how they would do that. Uh, <clears throat> so they're very, very hard to keep away from humans. It, and that's similar to all, all, all uh, carnivores in, in Africa, but painted dogs have a sort of a double whammy because where you find people, you find domestic dogs. Where you find domestic dogs, you find rabies and canine distemper. So they, they have, they're, they're getting it from both directions, if you will. Uh, and, and along with the incidental uh, problems that any predator would have with snares or getting hit on roads and so forth. So they really only thrive uh, in, in the Delta, in the, in the regions around the Delta. Botswana is the best place to find painted dogs, but they're in big trouble. So one of the ways we've discovered that we can help painted dogs is to keep them away from humans. And the way we can do that is through bio boundaries. Painted dogs are unique in that they respect one another's territorial boundaries. So we, we, we figured that what we could do is collect urine from a, a, a pack far, far away from our study group and then use that uh, urine to create an artificial boundary and, and keep the dogs in, essentially keep them away from human habitation sites. And darned if it didn't work, it works perfectly. Uh, they do respect those bio boundaries. They won't go into areas with humans. The problem, of course, is you can't just collect urine uh, from, from all over uh, painted dog packs all over the Okavango Delta and use it to protect all the areas you want to protect. So what we have to do is, is figure out how to take those organic volatiles, the, the, the smell from urine, the relevant smells, and reproduce it so we can put it in a squirt can and go squirt along areas where we don't want the, want the painted dogs to go. And in fact, that's what we're working on now through gas chromatography, uh, uh, mass spectrometry. Uh, we're, we're trying to figure out what part of the urine um, is, is relevant to the territorial boundary and how we can reproduce that and make it available to keep dogs in. So if, if that were the end of the story, um, you could see why St. Louis would, the St. Louis Zoo would say, that's fine, that's great, we're conserving these animals, let's do that. But Tico McNutt, the, the, uh, Dr. McNutt, the, the head of this, this research program, has a sort of a hidden agenda. Uh, what he wants to really do is unravel the whole language of smell. Um, you know, we can sit here, we all know that uh, uh, urine can say, this is my territory, stay out, or it can say, 
I'd like to mate, please come in. Uh, we, we know that it has stress hormones that, that probably have a olfactory component for dogs. Uh, probably the feel good hormones are there too. In fact, there's probably a lot of things that urine is saying. And, and as we track the dogs, as we use uh, the uh, uh, camera traps to monitor them, we're beginning to correlate behaviors with what we think might correlate with smell. And in the end, what Dr. McNutt wants to do is unravel that language of smell. Uh, he feels that that language is probably far richer than any of us can even envision. Uh, and uh, uh, we're supporting them in that effort, but of course our, our primary interest is conservation. So I'm delighted to tell you that if you would like to join me uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the painted dog researchers in the field camp out in the Delta, uh, you really only need three things, a uh, spirit of adventure, which I know all of you have in abundance, a valid passport, which I'm sure you all have. Uh, you also have to make a very large gift to the St. Louis Zoo, and then you'll be with me in the Delta. I'll be there twice next year. Um, if you come through for me, I'll be there a third time. So uh, thank you for your support. Thanks for listening this evening. Thanks, Jeff. That was, that was really great. Um, I, I, there were lots of things in that that I... I was not aware of. So um, thank you for educating at least me. Um, next, I want to present to you um, Dr. Sherman Silver, member national, 1998. Dr. Silver, as the director of the leading center for infertility treatment in the world, is a renowned pioneer in microsurgery and infertility. Is the innovator of the most of most of the high tech treatments used around the world for infertility patients. He is a consultant to zoos from many countries, actually the St. Louis Zoo, I believe, um, around the world. Um, and um, he, he is helping save the fertility and reproduction of endangered and exotic species. He's written 10 scholarly books that have been translated into English, Spanish, German, Russian, Chinese and Japanese, and over 300 peer-reviewed scientific papers in prestigious journals. His passion, however, is remote wildlife photography and videography with his son, Steve, the owner and current director of the Chulitna Chulit Chulit Lodge on Lake Clark in Alaska. So, um, Sherm? Okay, well, thank you uh, very much uh, for that introduction, uh, Cynthia. And I, I want to say that we all agreed when we were uh, together just uh, arranging uh, for this uh, meeting with the Explorers Club that what unites all of us is that we're in love with the universe. And uh, we all have very diverse and different interests. Uh, and uh, but what pulls us together is how are passionate we are about the world we live in. So uh, I'm gonna go to uh, my uh, first slide. I'm gonna talk to you about the North Pole and about the polar bear. Um, enter full screen. Okay. Um, okay, so I first went to the magnetic North Pole in 1986 with Eskimo patients. And I use the word Eskimo, even though it's considered a bad word in Canada, it is the normal and it's considered the appropriate word in Alaska. In Canada, these people would be called the Inupiat, standing for the people. Uh, and uh, there you can see the dog sled in front. And uh, we, uh, at, at the present time, the magnetic- Sherm, sure. Sherm, sure, excuse me. I, I, if you're showing a picture, we can't see it. You can't see it? No. Hmm. Um, well, maybe- no, we're, just, we're just seeing you at this time. Oh, okay. Uh, I think I, thank you for telling me that. Uh, I guess, I have to, um, I, uh, maybe Kevin, I, I don't know what the problem is here. Yeah, Kevin, could you maybe help us out here? Can you? Great. Yeah, we have to share a screen, I guess, and I probably forgot to do that. Have you got me sharing now or should I press share a screen now? No, we got, we got it. Kevin, Kevin's got it. Just okay. tell them what to change the slide. Thanks, good. Kevin. 
I uh, <laughs> thank God for Kevin Murphy. He gets great. But at any rate, you can see there I'm standing on a iceberg uh, looking at the sun trying to set at midnight and it never quite gets all the way down. This was in April of 1986 of the magnetic north pole. And uh, it was me and two Eskimos uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, our uh, two dog sleds. And uh, it was interesting that I, I brought my Hasselblad and my Nikon. I thought I had winterized, but uh, both of them froze. So this picture was taken by Eskimo colleague uh, with one of those uh, Kodak paper throwaway cameras because that didn't freeze up. It was about 75 degrees below zero. And Jack London talked about how at that temperature your spit freezes before it hits the ground. And uh, so this is one of my favorite pictures of all my wildlife pictures uh, and all my experiences. And it was taken with uh, by an Eskimo who wasn't really a photographer uh, with a uh, Kodak uh, Instamatic paper camera. But now I'll bring you to the present uh, when uh, my son Steve and I and my wife Joan uh, went up to uh, Kaktovik and we've uh, done this three times to really get a good view of the polar bears. Now in 1986, there was no problem for polar bears that we were aware of because the Arctic Ocean was uh, basically six feet of ice and uh, the polar bears uh, could find blowholes where they could easily get to seals and uh, that's how they live. And that's why they're so well nourished and so big and enormous. They have this tremendous hunting advantage. They're, there's no competition there. They can't be seen uh, in the snow because of their white fur and uh, their pointed nose and their uh, foot pads make it just perfect for them to sneak up on a snow hole and uh, get the seals. But now that's changing. And as the polar ice is beginning to recede, they're threatened because they really can't uh, survive very well on land. Uh, in fact, they evolved from the grizzly bear 200,000 years ago uh, as a fantastic mechanism for great nourishment by leaving land and going to the polar ice. And three things, of course, they developed. Uh, the white fur, the, the pointed snout, and uh, the uh, foot pads that allow them to walk on the ice with literally no sound. So. No, wait. Uh, oh, yeah. So this is, uh, if you look on this uh, map, uh, you can you can see uh, this is Prudhoe Bay, which is the famous uh, uh, oil rig, uh, oil find that uh, is not far from the Arctic National uh, Wildlife Refuge. And uh, this is the area that the Trump administration wants to open up to oil drilling. And... Um, it's not, uh, I don't know what's happening here. Um, my control just isn't working here. Um, so, Dr. Silver, I'm the one controlling. So you just have to see what I'm sharing and tell me when you want me to advance your slide. Well, that's right. Okay, so why don't you just go to the uh, next slide there, uh, the fourth slide, yeah. So uh, you can see that east of Prudhoe Bay is the Kaktovik, which is a little Eskimo village on a little island called Barter Island. And uh, this is uh, an area that right now uh, is in danger of oil well drilling. And uh, many conservation groups are lobbying strongly to try to prevent that from happening. And um, this Kaktovik area is where you can go to really uh, finally see the struggle of the polar bears to survive. And let's go to the next slide then. And uh, you can see uh, we've been in Alaska back and forth ever since uh, 1967 when my wife and I first went up there and we, uh, ha uh, we have a home there and a lodge there and it's like homes, but we've, we've witnessed these glaciers when they were coming all the way down to, in this case, Lake Clark, and they were spread out on either side of that canyon, you can see, and, uh, and now they're receding. They're magnificent, but they have receded uh, really almost 50% uh, of their original length, with, not original, but when we were first there in 1967. So we'll go to the next slide. And uh, uh, you can, you can uh, see the glaciers in their magnificence, but uh, they are just uh, fading away. And it, this process was beginning in the 20th century. Next slide. And uh, 
This, this glacier isn't so magnificent. You can actually see the glacial silt that's left behind as it's just uh, melting and disappearing all the way up to the top of the mountain. Next slide. And the polar bears are suffering uh, from this same uh, warming of the globe in this possible way. Uh, they have to be on the uh, Arctic Ocean and go to the seal blowholes to have their fantastic nutrition. And uh, they normally would go to land just for a few months in the summer, but by September, they would be going back out onto Arctic Ocean ice where they would be able to replenish themselves and have a good 10 months uh, of uh, no competition hunting for seal. And they, they would survive uh, amazingly, uh, beautifully well on a uh, frozen landscape but now they have to spend five months really on land and they would starve except for they're able to come to Kaktovik, uh, at least this Beaufort Sea a group of uh, polar bears and uh, actually eat on the remains of Eskimo whale kills that occur in early September. So go to the next slide. I'll, I'll show you a series of slides to tell you just how spectacular these animals are and uh, Global warming is a daunting problem that will take many years to solve and probably the Arctic Ocean and the polar and the uh, North Pole will just be all water in the next uh, 10 to 20 years unless we do something about it. But right now there's another risk to the polar bear and that is oil drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Reserve which will contaminate this area where they're trying to survive. Let's go to the next slide. And we'll just go one slide after. This looks like a painting. It looks like it's artificial or computer generated, but this is really what it looks like. Uh, th nothing has been done to Photoshop or doctor up this uh, slide. Uh, polar bears are just so magnificent, but you can see this isn't where they're supposed to be. And they can only survive on the remains of uh, Eskimo whale kills during this prolonged period of what would otherwise be starvation. Next slide. And we'll go through more so you can see them in front of the whale bones just posing for us. And you may not realize that they actually are brown skinned. Uh, polar bears are brown, but they uh, evolved this white fur so they could hunt on the Arctic Ocean and, and not be seen uh, by the seals. And you see the pointed snout that is different than a grizzly bear and allows them to dig with their uh, nose and their mouth right into the blowhole to pull the seal out. Next slide. Look at how phenomenal, next slide. And then I'm gonna show you a very brief video. Look at the, I mean, I think you could show this to uh, a human being, even if they're an oil well executive and they would, they would say, we can't drill here. Next slide. They just have to be a human being to understand that this is no place to find oil. Next slide. And now you're gonna see a family and I wanna show you how I think that if they survive at all, it'll only be by morphing back into grizzly bears, which they evolved from 200,000 years ago. Next slide. And you can see the ones that are spending more time already, their uh, white fur is turning uh, a, a darker shade. Next slide. And I wanna show this brief video and the sound will speak for itself and maybe uh, Bruce, or, uh, sorry, Kevin, you can make it uh, go for us. Can you start it? We got in a small boat and went very far out to a land rise that had on it the remains of a whale that was killed by the Nupiak Eskimos. They took all the good meat, of course, and the muktuk, which they love. But the polar bears were happy to have any remains they could. They would have possibly starved because the Arctic Ocean ice and the polar cap had receded so far that this was one of their few sources of food until the polar ice returns when winter arrives in October. We saw over 40 polar bears gathered around this area and they were doing quite well because of the whale kill of the Eskimos. But if it weren't for this whale kill, they would be stuck on land, which isn't a good place for them to hunt and they would literally starve until the ice came back, they could go back on the Arctic Ocean ice and hunt the seals through their blowholes. So with global warming and the ice farther and farther away from shore, 
They must leave their frozen paradise where seal hunting is so easy and travel early to the north shore of Alaska, to Kaktovik, to Barter Island, to eat the remains of the annual Inupiaq whale harvest. We were surrounded by all these polar bears, but there was nothing to fear as they certainly were not hungry at this moment. This, this whale carcass looks like it's been picked clean. You can see the vertebra and the ribs and you can hardly see meat on it, but the bears will scrape for whatever meat they can get and they can't wait until they have a chance to go back out on the ice. They forage around, eating whatever scraps they can, but they can't wait until that shore freezes and they can once more go back out on the ice. To watch a big mother polar bear nursing her lone cub while the winds are howling around you at 50 to 80 miles an hour, the rain is pouring and slanting on you and turning into snow and ice, and your face is freezing, it's inspiring to be with these polar bears in the element that they love and they do not find it all challenging. The cold, windy, rainy, foggy weather was a perfect backdrop for these powerful creatures, seemingly impervious to their challenging surroundings. But as the planet warms, ironically, and seems to become more hospitable, they will finally meet a challenge that may be insurmountable. As the polar ice melts and the weather gets, quote, nicer, end quote, they may finally meet their end. Out on the ice, as far north as the ice now melts to, there really are no seals because the ocean is too deep. So the polar bear has no choice but to try to make it to land. And it can't really swim more than 200 miles without drowning. So they come to land earlier and earlier and have more and more of a dry spell as the Arctic Ocean polar ice that normally surrounds land recedes further and further and eventually disappears. Ten years ago, the bear population in this area was about 1,500, but now it's down to about 900. They would always rather be out on the ice where the seal hunting is easier. They only come to land here because they have to. If they are landlocked, they will go extinct. But maybe not. Maybe rather than going extinct, they will just morph back into how they originated from grizzly bears. We were able to be very close to them. We were able to have our souls intertwine and melt. They swim very, very fast and very comfortably in the water. They frolic in the water, underwater and above water. They truly are incredible sea mammals and they are as comfortable in the water and under the water as whales and porpoises. The ice has melted and the ice flows are too far from shore. Many bears are trying to swim 200 miles from the nearest ice flow and they drown because they can't swim that far. They have to get to land because they can no longer really hunt that far out in the Arctic Ocean. They have to come to land to have any chance to survive. But their best survival is when they can hunt on Arctic Ocean ice that is somewhere near the shore and shallow water where there are plenty of seals swimming underneath. They are not meant to be vegetarians, but they, they will eat anything they can find, uh, even though what they really need to be nourished is seals. Here we are on the boat, Steve and myself, capturing these images. So excited and so proud of what we were able to explore. Kevin, I think we should stop it because I'm running out of time. There's a couple of more minutes, but we have more people uh, that have more interesting talks. But I think the point has been made, and I thank you for listening. Well, we have more people, sure, but we, we, I can't say that any are more interesting. That was, that was wonderful and fabulous, fabulous photos. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to introduce you next to Lotsi Holton, who's a member national, 97. Lotsi's one of the one of our really most fearless members of our chapter. Um, she's a seventh generation descendant of Captain William Clark, so maybe that's 
why it's easy to see why she's such an adventurer. Um, she's flown MiG jets, summited Mount Kilimanjaro, hiked the Everest Base Camp, and dove the Turks and Caicos Wall to see the migration of humpback whales. So Lotsi is going to tell us a fascinating family story. Lotsi, it's all yours. Okay, thank you, Cindy. My story starts about 10 years ago when I was serving on the board of American Rivers in Washington, D.C. Also on the board was a man named Stephen Ambrose who wrote this book, Undaunted Courage. It's a story about Lewis and Clark about 200 years ago, finding their way to the Pacific Ocean. We all know the story, so I won't go into that. But also serving on the board was a man named Ray Gardner who was the tribal chair of the Chinook nation. So we started talking and sharing our stories to find out that we were each seventh generation that my great, great, great William Clark stole the then chief, his great, great, great grandfather's canoe when they departed after spending the winter at Fort Clatsop. And he stole the canoe to get home and that stealing a canoe would be like stealing, kidnapping a person because it was such an, a, a personal uh, th a thing to own. So my husband, Rick, thought it would be a good idea to make an amend and have a canoe made to pay back this uh, debt that we owed 207 years, whatever later. So he went to uh, Oregon had a beautiful canoe made, and I think Kevin might have a picture <clears throat> of a canoe. <clears throat> okay, there's a, a lovely Chinook lady during the canoe ceremony. We had a five year, five hour ceremony in this canoe dedication that was terrific. And look at this beautiful lady and her in her dress of the Chinook Indians. And that's my son, Rick, on the right, who would be the eighth generation. I being the seventh, my two sons are here. Next slide, please. There, and there's my other son, Rob. And these are my two grandchildren who, who would be the ninth generation. And as you can see, we had hundreds of people there. We had um, many newspapers, radio stations, television stations. It was really quite, a, quite an exciting ceremony. Um, this is the tribal chief, Ray Gardner, uh, talking to my grandchildren there at the Pacific Ocean where all this happened 200 and something years ago. So this is in, in Long Beach. The ceremony was terrific. We were proud to make amends and to apologize and make friends with the uh, Chinook people who welcomed us with open arms. I think I have one more picture maybe. Oh, this is the part of the salmon ceremony during the five hours and the toasting and all that. A big, a big night is the first salmon run. And these are all beautiful butterflied salmon on the open stove, uh, the fire that we cut. Oh, and here is uh, Warren Petoskey, who's chief of the tribal um, Odawa and Luk Lakota tribes. He's from Harbor Springs where we are in the summer. And on the left here, you can see the rain hat of the Chinook, the, the famous uh, rain hat that they wear. So uh, what we found out through our seventh generations, it's never late to say you're sorry. And it's always great to, to right a wrong and make amends. So thank you for listening. That's a terrific story, Lotsi. Um, and I'm sure it was well appreciated by by the tribe who received it back. Um, anyway, let me now take you to Adam, Aaron Addison, who is a fellow national, um, 2015. Um, Aaron is a data and geospatial professional with over 30 years of experience in surveying caves and leading expeditions. His current projects, projects focus on exploration of the caves in the Galapagos Islands and Amazonia, Ecuador, as well as mapping work in the mapping work in the world's longest known cave at Mammoth Cave National Park in Kentucky. So, Aaron, thank you, Cindy. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully, everyone can see that. Uh, 
And I would echo the other the other presenters and saying thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about some of our uh, wanderings underneath the, the Galapagos Archipelago out in the Pacific Ocean. So uh, this is a much longer project of some 10 to 15 years at this point. Uh, we've barely scratched the surface, but um, this will give you a nice flavor of what's been going on there in this unique part of our planet. So the, the Galapagos Islands are located about a thousand kilometers off the coast of Ecuador. Uh, there's some evidence of ancient use through mainly the Incas. It was discovered by the whalers in the 1600s, but there are no indigenous people in Galapagos. And this is largely an artifact of there not being very much or any really fresh water to speak of in the islands. So uh, made it quite quite difficult for for colonies to get established there, although many tried, and there are some uh, interesting stories around those. Um, but really, the Galapagos made their way onto the world map and the world stage through the visit of Charles Darwin, who uh, famously studied the finches in Galapagos and were uh, some of the main input into to formulation of the survival of the fittest, so to speak, and, and associated research. So why are the Galapagos there? The Galapagos exist primarily for the same reasons that the Hawaiian Islands exist. So there's a hot spot that comes up from the core of the earth through the mantle. That rising bloom then manifests itself as volcanoes on the surface of the planet and they build up over time from the seabed to the peaks that we see in the ocean today. So in terms of the formation of the islands, it's, it's all the uh, shield volcanoes like we would see in Hawaii. All the strato volcanoes are relegated to the mainland of South America and uh, in the Pacific Northwest in North America. But we're interested in the caves. Um, the caves in Galapagos, we've documented about 50 or 60 caves at this point, and there are likely uh, many times more than that in the islands. And so we are systematically documenting all of these caves, both through exploration, but more importantly, through documentation, survey, cartography, map making, uh, and then supporting all the sciences on top of that, be them uh, geology, biology, paleontology, all of these types of things are facilitated by the collection and, and drafting of quality base maps. Uh, we have done a little bit of biologic work in the island that has resulted in uh, new descriptions, new records of uh, species that were not previously known from the Galapagos, but we also know that there are, are species that are unknown to science in the Galapagos. It's a matter of getting the right people from the right backgrounds in the right place at the right time to do the collections and, and then do the associated science. This is what the areas look like on uh, Santa Cruz Island, which I'm speaking about tonight. Uh, this is the top ridge of the island that runs east to west, more or less. And it's characterized by these enormous pit craters. And so this would be where the magma comes up and uh, manifests itself on the surface, flows down the slopes of the volcano. But whenever that magma recedes, the, the roof, if you will, or the ceiling of those magma chambers often collapse back into the main conduit. And you get these enormous, what we would call sinkholes, but they're really uh, um, more accurately described as evacuated magma chambers. And so these things, present their own ecosystems. There are things that are happening on the floor of these uh, pit craters that we don't see on the surface elsewhere and perhaps uh, anywhere else on earth, quite frankly, because there's a number of these that have never seen any sort of human visitation uh, at any point in history. The caves proper tend to be very warm as the islands are located on the equator uh, and they're almost always accessed through some sort of skylight entrance into the passageways. Here, uh, one of our Italian members on our expedition has climbed down into this opening and we started a survey on this uh, small cave. Not all the caves are small though. Here's a, a photo of one of my cartographers who's taking notes in one of the larger passages. And you can see the ah-ah uh -uh and what we call breakdown on the floor, the just chunks of lava, be them big or small that characterize lava tubes. 
Many of them have very lush openings that are uh, adorned by ferns and other types of vegetation. And, uh, and we work through the jungle that is the rainy side of the island, uh, oftentimes in order to make our way to the entrances of the caves. Not all the passages are large though. Here's a smaller passage that uh, my colleague Scott is ex examining and you can see a trench ahead of him in the floor where you would have to climb down to continue on in the passage. You can also see in the foreground, the lava sickles hanging off the ceiling where the cooling lava uh, freezes in place and forms very much the same kind of structure that you would see in a limestone cave, the uh, stalactites, but in this case, they're made entirely of, of cooled lava. Here's a much larger version of a trench in the floor and you can see the lava benches on each side. These tend to form as the lava is cooling over time and the warmer, hotter lava is still, still flowing in the center part of the passage. Whenever that lava finally runs its course and runs down the volcano, you're left with these really nice uh, photogenic benches along both sides of the wall. Passages get even smaller at times and nearly sealed off. Here's a very uh, small crawlway where one of our Ecuadorian team members is crawling through from one side to the other. And when you go through this small part, it may only be small for uh, you know less than 10 meters, but then it oftentimes will open up into a much larger conduit on the other side and the cave will continue down the, the slope of the volcano. Lava tubes generally are not very deep, no matter where you're at in the world. Uh, certainly in Hawaii and Galapagos, they're, they're oftentimes only a few meters from the surface. So it's, it's not uncommon at all to see skylights where the roof is broken through over time. And then you have uh, all kinds of things that enter into the cave, be them uh, plants or wildlife. This, this particular tube system has a number of barn owls that live inside the, the tube system at the entrances. And they really wanted me to cut this tree down because it's an invasive species in Galapagos, but uh, nobody would give the, give the guy a machete to cut it down another day for him. Um, some of the caves are brilliant with color. Here you see the golds, blacks, whites along the walls from the, uh, the cooling lava. Some of the skylights and entrances are quite large. Here my colleague Rick is uh, moving in to look at a, uh, a translucent millipede that's crawling on the floor in front of him. The passages can be very narrow and tall. This is likely the result of multiple flows coming down the, the slopes in the same area. And, uh, and again, with the skylight at the top there and the vegetation growing right under it. Just another shot of characteristic passage, a couple of those. This shows a cross section of how the lava benches form. They, they usually build up in layers as the lava is cooling. So I thought this was a nice illustration of how that, that comes to be. Couple last passage shots here. And then uh, a little bit of data and what we're up to. Uh, March of this year, just ahead of the lockdown for COVID, we were able to complete our latest expedition in Galapagos. I actually made it back into the US less than 12 hours before the, the borders of Ecuador were closed. Uh, but we documented a, an ongoing tube named Sistema Silvana or Cave of the Jungle, Cave of the Forest. And it's now the longest known lava tube in South America. So we were able to establish a new record uh, during our March expedition this year. So Silvana is down here in the, the lower part of the image. There's another long tube system up, up to the north called La Legada, and we're hopeful that we can close this five, six kilometers between these two caves, but would make it an undisputed record and really a world-class lava tube system. And yet, even if we're able to do that, this is just the small part of that overall flow. These white lines represent the potential flow boundaries for this part of the volcano, and so you can see the the chance that we'll find an even much longer cave system, which ultimately the, that lava went all the way to the Pacific Ocean up here on the top part of the photo, uh, our, our chances are good. 
And so it's just a matter of doing the, the slow field work and the proper documentation of these world-class resources to uh, fill in those blanks. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Um, I have to say that I'm, I'm actually um, amazed that, that um, you can go into caves and get through the holes the size of which you were showing. <laughs> incredible. Um, well, we have one more um, person to speak, and then I'm going to finish up with a few remarks about myself. But right now, we're going to hear from Marguerite Garrett, member National 03. Um, Marguerite is the immediate past chair of the St. Louis chapter. She was exposed to the world of animals as a young person, as her father, Marlon Perkins, was one of the St. Louis Zoo's most eminent directors. And he was also the host of the Emmy-winning um, show, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm, I know a lot of us remember that show very fondly. Marguerite has been part of the Endangered Wolf Center since inception, and she is active at the St. Louis Zoo and many other wildlife organizations. So Marguerite, love to hear from you. Marguerite, are you muted? Marguerite, I think you're muted. I'm unmuted now. Okay, good. Sorry, I've been doing that all day. I've been in Zoom meetings all day long. Sorry, um, Kevin, could we have my um, PowerPoint, please? Thank you so much, Kevin, for doing this. The Endangered Wolf Center um, turns 50 this year. Next slide, please. It was founded in 1971 by my parents, Carol and Marlon Perkins. Um, Marlon was um, retiring from the zoo in, in uh, early 1970. And in 1969, he invited all the known wolf biologists, and ethologists working in the field to come to St. Louis for a meeting to assess um, the situation of uh, wolves in the lower 48 states. And they discovered, and I got to be there because I was a senior in high school that year, but um, they found that it was worse than they thought. And there were only um, remnant populations of the very endangered red wolf and Mexican gray wolf um, left in the South. So a bold decision was made. And for the very first time, um, wolves were all of the wild population of Mexican gray wolves, which was the first species they focused on, were pulled from the wild and um, put into captive breeding programs. And it was my dad's decision to keep them as wild as possible because the goal was always to release them back into the wild when um, human hearts and minds could be changed. Um, so, um, the very seven wolves, um, next slide, please. Um, they opened in 1971 um, at uh, a 63 acre portion of a 2000 wooded acre property belonging to Washington University, the Tyson Valley Research Center. And Washington University has been the most wonderful partner uh, with the Endangered Wolf Center and has hosted us there, as I said, for we're really 51 years because we were in construction before that. Our other wonderful partners are the St. Louis Zoo, who have been very involved from the very beginning, um, supporting us with veterinary care um, and all kinds of other um, things that we've needed to have at our small location that we haven't had the funds or the room for, although we've just built a veterinary clinic. Um, our other great partners are the Fish and, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, the Sonora Desert Museum. Next slide, please. Just wanted to show you this picture because um, these are the two critically endangered uh, wolves that we have, the um, Mexican gray wolf on the left and the red wolf on the right. Next slide, please. Mexican wolves um, were listed as endangered in 1976, as you can read yourself, and uh, declared extinct in the wild in 1980. 
Um, and that's the year the last wild wolf was caught and brought into captive breeding program. So nine years later, they began to be released back into the wild in 1998. That took a really long time. Um, next slide, please. Uh, they were released into the Blue Mountain Recovery Range of Arizona, New Mexico in the Apache National Forest. Um, approximately, there, as it says, 250 in captivity now, 131 are known of known wild wolves um, are wild in the US, which, so we went from zero to 131 and uh, all of those wolves can trace their um, lineage back to the Endangered Wolf Center. So my parents accomplished um, one of their goals, which was to see Mexican gray wolves back in the wild. Um, there are also about 30 wolves in Mexico where releases have been going on in the last couple of years. Next slide, please. The red wolf um, is the other critically endangered um, wolf. And in um, 19, it was completely extirpated from its original range in the 70s and um, came to the um, Endangered Wolf Center in 1981, several breeding pairs, and eight animals from the Endangered Wolf Center were released in 1987 into a National Wildlife Refuge in North Carolina. Um, and I just love this, that the alpha female was named Brindled Hope. Um, the, their numbers got up to about 60 over 30 years or more, and um, then various things occurred. They were shot um, and they caught diseases and uh, they're now down to about 20, but there are more new release plans in the works for red wolves. Um, next slide, please. Um, uh, I just think wolves are so beautiful. I makes me happy every time I look at one. Um, the, there is kind of a road to recovery um, underway for red wolves. Um, the current zoological captive breeding populations, 257. There are 30 breeding pairs um, and they're all um, under a red wolf species survival plan, which is um, administrated by the American Zoological Association, the AZA, which we've been, a, the sanctuary has been an accredited member for um, more than 20 years. Um, and uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service has set a biological minimum, which seems pretty low, but it's good for 400 animals with 52 breeding pairs. Next slide, please. We have webcams on all of our, on a lot of our um, enclosures. Uh, 900,000 people from all over the world tune into our webcams to watch our wolves. Could you run the video, please? Thank you. I just thought you'd like to hear this. Not a lot of people have heard a red wolf howl. Um, you can, yeah, stop. And next slide, please, yes. Um, on the left is a picture of our rock star um, director of animal care and um, conservation, uh, Regina Mazzotti. And she's receiving the very prestigious um, Edward Bean Award from the AZA. Um, and I just wanna mention that in the last five years, Regina has um, been the driving force in the incredibly creative and amazingly successful release of more than 27 captive born puppies back into wild dens, all born at the Endangered Wolf Center. Um, that There's a webinar about that. And if you get in touch with me, I can give you the link to it. Next slide, please. Um, the, there's still a lot to be done uh, to change people's hearts and minds um, so that wolves can once again uh, attain their role as apex predator, predators in the wild. And we know 
now that that is an incredibly important part of keeping an ecosystem healthy and keeping um, diseases in ungulates down. So I just um, thank you all for listening. I can't tell you how proud I am of my parents' vision. Well, and you carried it on spectacularly, Marguerite. And, and um, we've been treated a number of times to ex, you know, to come out to the Endangered Species Center. And um, we've all heard the, the howls ourselves. And I can assure you it's a very special, special thing. So thank you. Um, well, I guess it's now up to me and I'm, I'm gonna go fairly quickly so that we can, um, I'm gonna run through, I hope you understand, so we can get to some question and answers. So um, let me just sort of start here by saying that um, before I was president, president of the chapter, head of the chapter, I was um, secretary of the board and on the library and archives committee um, in New York. Um, and I've done lots of things in our chapter here. I'm a native St. Louisan, and um, I was very lucky because I was exposed to um, adventure and exploration when I was very young. Um, as a young child in the late 1950s, um, I traveled to Fiji and the French Polynesian Islands. And then not, not too long after that, um, went to Syria and Lebanon and Africa, Asia, just many different places. So I think that's the reason that um, I have a lifelong interest in anthropology um, and conservation. Um, but I've continued to, to do the traveling um, and exploring for many years. Uh, a lot of the places that I've been, I've been with other explorers and we've um, studied and, and had lectures on all sorts of different things. Um, one of the places we went, um, slide please, um, was um, the Central African Republic. Um, and we experienced life with the Bacchus there. We also, next slide please, um, trekked with the elephants and, and lowland gorillas. And um, while we were there, we participated with Andrea Turkolo in studying the forest elephants, next slide please, in the Zanga Zanga um, clearing. Next slide please. As a compliment, to um, trekking the lowland gorillas. I was able to study orangutans in Borneo at Camp Leakey um, in the Tanyong National Park, which was established by Rute Daladikas. Um, with other of our chapter members, um, I sailed the Komoro Islands and we spent time filming and studying the endangered um, Komodo dragons. Um, Quickly, a more, thank you, a more recent project, we went to um, Myanmar to study the Cayenne people in Kaya State. Uh, we went behind political and tourist borders and spent time in several villages observing and interacting and celebrating with the villagers. We observed women grooming and showing their young daughters and granddaughters how to place position necks um, in the customary way, but I will tell you, none of us tried it. Um, and um, we also took part in many other villages celebrations and ceremonies. Um, we're gonna quickly go through um, the one that we did. This was um, uh, a tree ceremony in which the local shaman um, determines the outcome of the village's future by um, chicken bone prognostation. Uh, to get there, we had to wake up at two o'clock and we trekked through the forest um, with only the moonlight and bird calls to tell us the way from the local guides. Um, although we did make it without killing ourselves. It was, it was touch and go there for a while. Um, after the shaman killed the chicken, they um, picked out a tree to take back to the village. Um, they stripped it of its, its bark and then made it back, uh, took it back to the village, which was quite a ways away. It was probably about an hour, an hour more away. After that, um, there was some, we participated in ceremonies. Here's an actual shot of the pronostication um, in the village again um, after the initial ceremony. And um, they started um, putting up the tree, um, which would, um, had augured um, good fortune um, befalling the village in the future. Um, I will say um, one more thing that, one more expedition I'm going to talk about is um, my trek 
to base camp of Mount Everest. Uh, in 2007, I participated along right here with my two daughters, and as luck would have it, our current president, Richard Weiss. I was one of 198 volunteers in the Caldwell Extreme Everest Expedition. The purpose of the British-led expedition, sorry about that, speaking too fast, um, was to research to see how humans adapt to hypoxia um, in extreme conditions with the hopes that it would better help the understanding of um, oxygen deprivation in critically ill patients. Um, also, as a final note, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, uh, my conservation work. Um, I've been active in conservation in both Idaho and Missouri. In Idaho, I began in 1988 to help restore riverbanks and maintain the natural water flow. The task um, over the past 30 years has really become much more difficult. Um, but the efforts remain strong, and um, certainly through the, through the past 30 years, there have um, possibly warded off catastrophic events to the, to the uh, area. Um, however, I guess my great love is here in St. Louis with the Missouri Botanical Garden, um, MOBOT, as we like to call it, um, is, as Peter told you, world-renowned in its conservation efforts globally, and I have been very lucky and fortunate to be the Gardens Conservation Mission Council's head since 2013. Um, as a chair of the council, it's my duty to make sure guidance and advice is given to the garden leadership on the garden's conservation programs, priorities and activities, as well in the area of plant-based sustainable development initiatives. We've tackled difficult issues and have helped the garden's efforts to make a print pronounced difference in our region and elsewhere. I have been privileged to be a member of the board of directors um, for the past 13 years. And although I am now emeritus, I continue to be chairman of the Conservation Mission Council. So it's, it's really been a, a pleasure for all of us to be able to tell you a bit about ourselves. And I only wish we had more time um, to let you meet more of our members because they're, they're, really, they're really superstars, all of them. But Tim, I'm handing it off to you now. Thank you, Cynthia. And thank everyone for the great presentations that you gave. Uh, we'll start, I'll have you join me now for a question and answer session. And I wanted to start off by asking Peter something. Uh, Marguerite raised the, you know, the idea of you know, um, doing captive breeding and then reintroduction of species into the natural environment. Do you know of any such programs that are being done for plant species? And are, are there any particular challenges with doing that? It's, it's certainly a, a major task for botanic gardens to, to for example, to be involved in uh, reintroduction programs. Uh, ultimately, you can conserve species in cultivation, uh, but you have to establish them, reestablish them in the wild. So uh, most major botanic gardens are now involved in reintroducing uh, rare and endangered plants back into the wild and recovering them so that they can ultimately become self-sustaining in the wild. So it's it is a it's a task which all of us are um, ultimately aiming to achieve. Yeah. Great. You know, Anne, I think we're kind of limited on time here. I think we should try to open it up to questions from the audience right now. Okay, so I'm going to start off also with Peter. Um, this is from Arnella. Uh, qu question, plants and geckos. Is there a specific gecko, which is the pollinator? Is this gecko endangered? The, the, um, the gecko that pollinates the Nesocodon mauritianus that I showed is a wonderful little gecko called Felsuma ornata, a multicolored uh, little gecko, which, um, which uh, whenever I've been living in Mauritius, I've always been happy to have um, scurrying across the, the walls in wherever I'm staying. But it is, um, it is I think, an endemic species for Mauritius uh, and is the one that is uh, said to 
to uh, be attracted to the nesocodon. There is a public paper published recently which actually showed that they prefer the red colour of the, the nectar to other sweet nectars that they might find. So it's clearly a, a parallel evolution to, to make the gecko, this particular gecko, uh, love the Mauritian bellflower. So normally I would say that um, Jenny might have a question for you being that Jenny Wokowicki is from Mauritius, but she actually has a question for Bruce. And this is, um, how do decision-making authorities proceed in cleanup efforts when it comes to evaluating the use of oil dispersants against oil pollution near coral reef areas? Do cleansing solutions destroy coral reefs in the long run? Well, I regret to say that uh, that's the kind of question you'll really need to address to the U.S. EPA or the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. I defer to them for that very specific kind of question. Sorry. Okay. Um, the next question we have is for Sherman. Sherman, are you there? Dr. Silver? No. Sherman, you're on mute and we can't see you. Are you still with us? Well, maybe we'll go to another question again. Maybe he'll come back. Is going to um, Lotsi. Uh, could you please tell us a little bit more information and, and uh, about your, your ancestral tree um, and, and maybe what artifacts you have um, from maybe the Lewis and Clark expedition? Okay, thank you. Uh, most of the, the beautiful things are here at the Missouri Historical Society, like William Clark's journals and that type of a thing. Um, I do have some, uh, a bronze of him that was dedicated down under the St. Louis Arch. And being a sponsor of the bronze, it's, oh, it's probably five, five feet tall, but it's a miniature of the bronze. And I do have um, some of his, the silverware from when he returned and he was the, he ran for governor and he was head of the uh, Indian affairs here. And remember, this is in 1806. So this is over 200 you know, years ago. But my given name was Carlota Clark. And his great granddaughter was Carlota Clark. And now I have a granddaughter named Carlota Christie Clark. So yes, the name is running um, down through the ninth generation. And we have multiple cousins and all that. And he is actually buried here in St. Louis at Bell Fountain Cemetery. So we're proud to honor his legacy. And there have been umpteen, you know, of course, books written about him. And some people say it was one of the greatest um, explorations of all times to go two years into unknown territory at the direction of President and say, go west and find a water route to the Pacific Ocean. So it's a great story. Thank you. It is. It's a terrific story. And when I'm looking behind you, you have incredible artifacts behind you. Um, maybe one day we're just going to take a tour of your home and have you give us a, a little brief description of what's going on there. We're all in um, St. Louis. We'd love to be there. Trust me. Uh, the, next, the next question is from Robert DeMaio, who is the uh, chapter chair of the Southwest chapter. And this is for Dr. Bonner. When the painted dogs bring back food for the pups and babysitter adults, do they drag it back or regurgitate it? Yes, they do both. Yeah, as far as I know, they do both. They, they've brought back meat before, but they certainly regurgitate, yeah. Okay. Uh, Jenny Wilkwicki is asking again, scientific studies have shown the importance of wolves in stabilizing ecosystems. However, Alaska has specific predator control plans. Hunters are allowed to use a plane or helicopter to herd wolves into an open space, a frozen lake, then land the aircraft to shoot the exhausted animals. What are your views on the practice as far as equilibrium of ecosystems are concerned? And I guess that could be for, for, for both of you, um, Marguerite and also Jeff. Well, well go. you go ahead, Jeffrey. Uh, it's horrible. <laughs> it's a, it's yeah, it is. Just not interfere with it in terms of the ecological balance. If, if we could just step back as far away as we could from that. 
um, you've all seen the wonderful video of wolves in Yellowstone and, and understand uh, what, what can happen if we just get a critical mass of predator species and an appropriate balance between predator and prey. And that's not what's happening in so many places around the, around the world. And wolves, I think in particular, uh, suffer uh, uh, from that prejudice. Uh, uh, painted dogs do in Africa as well. They, they basically eat their prey on the hoof uh, they eat them alive, and I, I think that people have have concluded that they're just awful animals as a consequence, and that's part of the persecution behind it, and it's uh, completely uh, unfounded and bizarre from my point of view, but I, I'll, I'll defer to Marguerite, but I, it's, it's just such a terrible thing. It's hard to, to not get upset about that. Well, and everybody should be upset about it, and I think generally, and this is my view, not the view of the Endangered Wolf Center, um, the um, uh, wolves are scapegoats over and over again for bad management of prey species and disappearance of habitat. Um, so that's, I think, why that's happening. Thank you. Another question for you, Marguerite, and that is, um, we all we did all grow up with your your dad and watching that show. Do you have any, have any favorite um, stories that you want to tell us about, you know, one of those episodes? Sure. Um, uh, he would come home from his trips and we'd be sitting around the dining room table and he'd want to know, you know, if I got a part in the school play or something or what I got on my math test. And we don't really talk about his trip too much, even though we'd ask him. And then we'd be sitting all together watching the Wild Kingdom episode. And um, we'd come to things like that famous episode where he was really almost drowned by an anaconda um, in, in Venezuela. And uh, <laughs> uh, luckily, you know, we always thought the cameraman would drop the camera, you know, and go try to save him, but that never happened. But luckily there was somebody else there who could help unwind the snake from him. Um, but yeah, he was just always so modest about all of it. I have a, a film that's an hour and a half of outtakes where he almost got killed filming Wild Kingdom, but he just kept going back. He was an amazing person. So thank you so much for, for recalling some of those stories for us. Um, uh, this one is for Lotsi. Is the canoe still in use for ceremonies or available for viewing anywhere? And this is from Juard. Um, from the Pacific Northwest chapter. Oh, interesting. Yes, it's very much in use. You can uh, Google Chinook, Reparation, Canoe, Clark family, any of those words. And we have hundreds of stories, front page newspaper articles. They use it all the time in their parades and their ceremonies. And you saw the pictures, it's perfectly beautiful and it's very much honored and it, it really, is the memorial for a long, for 200 and something years of um, reparation. So it's very honored canoe and it's very, very much in use. I've been in the canoe and everyone is welcome um, to call the Chinook Nation or whatever. They would be very proud to show it off. It's a, it's a beautiful work of art. Thank you. Uh, another question for Dr. Bonner. Um, any increase in wild dog casualties now that tourism is down or um, or disarmed uh, their rangers? Wow, such a great question. I don't know the answer. Uh, the, the, the folks are still at the field site. Uh, some of them that were out there uh, managed to remain out there, but the research has really, really cut back. Uh, Botswana just opened up to, uh, to uh, private uh, planes that come in across the border, but they still haven't really opened up the, the field site. So it's a great question. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer, but it'll be really interesting to find out. Um, one more question, and this is for all of you. We have a question about the expeditions that you've been on. How many of them were flag expeditions? So maybe you want to, you want to talk about, um, go ahead, Jeff, why don't you take it? Your, Not your for me. No, no, I'm, I'm out doing the grunt work. Well, you should be applying for a flag and take that <laughs> along with you. Um, maybe the next one, because it looks like a, a lot of people are going to want to go with you. So, um, <laughs> Uh, that would be great. How about how about any any of you out there? Uh, any other flag expeditions, Aaron? I have been on cave expeditions that were flag expeditions. We have not had one yet in Galapagos. 
but it's definitely on the on the list. I was fortunate enough to be on a flag expedition in the Galapagos, so I did witness some of those caves that you're talking about. You were you were talking about the length of them, but you didn't really specify what was the longest um, uh, cave there. Sure. So the the long long standing record holder is on the other side of the same volcano, a cave called Cascajo, and it was just under four kilometers long. Uh, Sistema Savana is now over four kilometers long, about 4.2, and we still have many, many passages to explore there. So we're confident in saying that it's surpassed Cascajo, which is, has a known end to it. Um, but these caves are all still quite a ways from the ocean. So there's, there's a lot of territory yet to explore. Thank you. And our last question is gonna go back to the beginning to Peter. Um, you were talking about Madagascar, and although we've already spoken about geckos and pollination, um, do you, have you witnessed the um, pollinations of uh, vanilla plants? Because that's fascinating, right? I can't, can't say I've ever actually seen pollination of v vanilla, but of course, so much, so many people now know uh, that so much important vanilla comes from Madagascar and it's important economic crop. Um, of course, we grow vanilla here at the Missouri Botanical Garden and love telling people that in fact it's an orchid. But I've never seen it being pollinated, but I must see if we can try here in the garden and produce our own pods. It'd be incredible, absolutely. Well, I think that pretty much concludes all our questions from the audience, except for one. And this one is to Tim. Everybody wants to know about your jacket. I'm sorry, but so many people have asked. So could you just say a few words, Tim? Yes, I purchased it off the, uh, off the Explorers Club um, store. Um, it's not available all the time, I don't believe, but I keep an eye on it because I, I missed it the last time and I was really kind of upset about it. So I kept looking and it, came, it became available again because I guess you have a run uh, a run period where they, they make them and, uh, and I was able to, to land one of them and you know the money helps the club out and it, it really has come very comfortable and I love it. So for those of you fashionistas out there just contact Andrew with the club and um, when they're back in stock I'm sure you can buy one too but in the meantime I just want to say thank you to, to Cindy for putting together just an incredible grouping of people amazing work I'm sorry that that Sherman wasn't around, but he was telling us yesterday that aside from doing um, fertility work, infertility work, he's also working with the zoo. Jeff, is that correct? Oh yeah, yeah. You know, Sherman was a pioneer in vasectomy reversal. He was uh, uh, really on the cutting edge of that. And he was the first person to ever do a vasectomy reversal in a canid or dog species. He did it at the St. Louis Zoo. And he said, I practiced on thousands of less important specimens before I did that singularly important species. So if he were here, he would second that. Incredible. Um, I'm sorry he's not here to, to talk for himself, but thank you so much for adding that to it. And, and back to Cindy. Th Cindy, thank you again. Uh, I just want to say thank you to Peter and Bruce and Jeff and Sherman and Lotsey, Aaron, Marguerite. Incredible work that you're doing. And we're so proud to have you as members of the Explorers Club and so thrilled that you were able to present this evening. And uh, I'm sure that people around the club will get in touch with you when we're back up and able to travel. So thank you so much. Um, the next chapter connect I believe will be in um, on the 17th of December and it will be the Africa chapter. Uh, in the meantime, I hope you'll stay tuned next Monday night for the Narwhal Arctic Expeditions of 2020 with Martin, Dr. Martin Nuea. So thank you everyone for watching, Tim. Yes, th thank you, our panel, you did a great job. Um, very smooth, very professional, loved it. And uh, we'll see everybody back in two weeks, I guess, for the next program. So Cindy? thank you all. Thank, thank you. I, I just wanna say quickly, thank you to, to you especially, Ann, because you put these on all the time and it's it's a tremendous amount of work and you do it with a smile and are so gracious about it. And we were delighted to be able to um, present our chapter. I, I well, nothing can more make me more happy than to, to see everyone 
and to connect everyone. And a big thank you out to Kevin for helping to put it all together. So have a great night, everyone. And we'll look forward to seeing you on Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Good Bye, night. Everyone. Bye everyone. Thanks Thank again. You.